now want to welcome the next set of subject matter experts. I know you guys know your subject matter experts uh, as we discuss innovation within sports. Uh, so joining us for the next session, we have three gentlemen, uh, Mike Petriello, who is the host of StatCast podcast and StatCast analyst with Major League Baseball. Uh, we've got Chris Levine, manager of business analytics with the Chicago Blackhawks. And we have Andrew McIntyre, who is the SVP of technology and innovation of Vinick Sports Group down in Tampa with the Tampa Bay Lightning and more. So I'm going to hand it off to these guys really quickly, just like we did in the last session. Andrew, Mike, Chris, if you wouldn't mind, take one moment, introduce yourself and just give a quick little uh, synopsis of who you are. Uh, sure, I'll go first. I'll jump, I'll jump the line here. Um, my name is Mike Petriello. I write for MajorLeagueBaseball.com, where I've been for five or six years, focusing on StatCast and advanced stats and helping our big network of writers understand how to use any of this stuff. Uh, previously, I've written at Fangraphs and ESPN, and sometimes I get to go talk about baseball on ESPN as well. Very nice. Hey everyone, thanks for having us. Chris Levine, I'm our manager of business analytics at the Blackhawks. Uh, so kind of a wide ranging title, but we work, uh, me and my team work across the entire business, uh, just trying to help us get to, to better business solutions and, and drive revenue for the team. We appreciate you coming to us from the locker room, Chris. That was great. It smells great in here. <laughs> Andrew. Hello, everyone. Uh, Andrew McIntyre uh, coming to you from Tampa, Florida. So you might see a little bit of the, the, the wonderful weather we're having in the, out the back of my windows here. Um, I'm with uh, Vinick Sports Group. I head up the technology and innovation practice. I've uh, been with the group uh, coming up on two years. Uh, the Vinick Sports Group, as, as Michael mentioned, is responsible for the Tampa Bay Lightning, Emily Arena, and then we have uh, uh, several other businesses that we've launched uh, in the Tampa region. We've partnered up with the University of South Florida, their athletic department, and we're running the Yingling Center, which is where they play men's and women's basketball and volleyball. And we also have an over-the-top network called the Identity Tampa Bay, which is a lifestyle network down here. Uh, previous to moving to Tampa, uh, I was with the Chicago Cubs for about eight years. Um, and before that was just completely outside of sports, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah, that's yeah, fantastic, guys. Thank you very much. Um, along those lines, and you mentioned you'll be talking about in a little bit, Andrew, let's we'll start with a career question. So what made you, and we'll start with you, Andrew, what made you want to pursue a career in sports? And were there any steps that said, how do you accomplish it? But what were the steps? Did you have to take any specific steps to get there? So, so my path is probably a little bit more uh, unique than, than several others. Um, when I was at University of Illinois, I was uh, studying mechanical engineering. Uh, no negative to mechanical engineers out there, but I realized I didn't want to become a mechanical engineer after my four years of college. Um, love the background, the problem solving, uh, the ability to, um, uh, to break down a problem and, and, and execute it. Um, so great, great components of that program, but for me, it just wasn't my passion. Uh, but what it did do is open up a door into consulting. And so I started my career in consulting, specifically, I'm going to date myself here, it was Anderson Consulting, which, as you may or may not know, no longer exists. It's now called Accenture. So, um, but I started in consulting, and I really, really enjoyed that. Um, my family, uh, we started a little bit earlier than expected. Um, so we have twin boys that are now 20, turning 21 this year. Uh, they're actually juniors down at the University of Illinois uh, in the College of Engineering. Uh, but when when I when we started our family, I decided I need to get off the road. I was traveling, you know, five days a week, leave Monday morning or Sunday night, and come back Friday night or even sometimes Saturday morning. So that's tough when you have little kids at home and, and trying to balance that out. So then I moved into corporate, moved into financial services industry, I'm still staying in the IT and technology field, and then a, a very unique opportunity popped up. Uh, the Ricketts family purchased the Cubs back in 2009. They built out their first wave of leadership um, with her across sales and marketing, uh, across their uh, chief financial officer, head of strategy. And they were looking for the next tier of senior leadership. And they were looking for a new leader of the technology space. And um, they hired a management consulting firm 
who was looking across the leagues um, and they identified, you know, with the stronger leaders inside of sports, at least guys like uh, Bill Schlau from the San Francisco Giants or Neil Weiss from the Indians. Um, these guys all had a background outside of sports and then brought that skill set, that knowledge of other industries to sports. And that was a huge differentiator for bringing new ideas, new concepts, new thought patterns into sports. And that's what the Cubs wanted to do. And I was lucky enough to get the tap on the shoulder with my consulting and then corporate background to say, bring all of the best practices from those industries to sports and help us transform the Cubs. And uh, so that's kind of like my unique little tale is it didn't start in sports, but it kind of wound its way there. And, you know, very, very fortunate that got the opportunity and we've done some great things. And now I have an opportunity down here in Tampa. Yeah, I love that. And, and guys, I, I speak to the audience here for a second. You, you, we're seeing this as we talk to our panelists just over the three that we've done so far, that there is no one way into this. And some people are very linear with their path and some people are very meandering with their path, sometimes by choice and sometimes by life. Uh, and, I, and I love that, that you can make those moves along the way and go to school for one thing and be something completely different, uh, which I think is a very, very uh, normal thing. Uh, these days, which I, I think is fantastic. So, uh, Mike, tell us a little bit about what made you pursue this career and if you had to take any specific steps. Yeah, I don't want to totally steal Andrew's story of a winding road here, but um, I, have a history, <laughs> I have a history degree and I didn't get my first full-time job in sports until I was 34. <laughs> you know, so I love it. There's, there's a lot of that. I mean, it's a long story, but the short version of it is um, I, my first taste of sports is actually an internship when I was in school at Boston University. And um, I got an internship working in the truck for Nesson. That's the TV station that does Bruins hockey and Red Sox baseball. So I spent the summer of 2003 in the, in the winter around those two teams, um, which was great, but it didn't lead to a job. And then what happened was I ended up uh, working at this video on demand startup that is like long dead, but ahead of its time. And I think that kind of stuff helped me like not working in sports right away, because from there I went to this digital PR firm where I project managed website builds for all sorts of stuff. And when I finally got into sports, like, yeah, people know me as a writer, but I know Photoshop and I know a little bit of code and I know some project management and have all those various skills um, I think have really been applicable in baseball. Uh, but anyway, I did that. And the, the way the career started was um, I started a blog. I started a blog about the Dodgers, uh, which, you know, was a thing people did before Twitter. So this is like 2007. Blog. And at, at blog. <laughs> I know it was named after a Simpsons joke. It was very 2007. And at the time, like I, you know, I, I'm not a math major. I, I feel like I can explain these things well enough, but I'm certainly not, you know, a physicist or anything like that. I'm a history major. Um, but at the time, in baseball, this is like right before, you know, it was after Moneyball, the book, before Moneyball, the movie. It was right before the technology came in uh, in 2008 to do pitch tracking. And at the time, most of the beat writers and national beat writers were writing like they were writing in 1962. You know, like nothing had really changed and using these stats and for what I did uh, to write about advanced baseball thinking specific to one team on a daily basis with like a little bit of a sense of humor, I like to think. Lots of you know, I'm not a journalism major either, right? So I'm not writing AP style. Um, people seem to like it. And even though I didn't make any money, it was just a side gig. I enjoyed it so much that I did it for years. And um, it, it, people liked it enough that it got me some opportunities. Like I wrote for a fantasy baseball site that got acquired by Baseball Prospectus. And that got me noticed to get hired on at Fangraphs. And from there, they had a content par uh, sharing partnership with ESPN. So I submitted to ESPN once a week. And as it turns out, a lot of this is about connections because my editor at ESPN quit, went to Major League Baseball. And the next year, StatCast came online and he realized, man, I need someone who can write about any of this. And he knew me and we'd worked together well and we were friends. And he called me and said, hey, come do this. And uh, that was six years ago. That's unbelievable. Mike Petriella can't hold a job, it sounds like. <laughs> This is the longest job I've had. I can tell you that. <laughs> That's fantastic, guys. I love these. Uh, Chris, give us your past. Give us your history and your path to get here. Yeah. Uh, I can pull from both Mike and Andrew a little bit. Um, but I, I knew, I think, when I was younger that I always wanted to be in sports in, in, in some shape or form. You know, like I was lucky enough to, to attend a lot of games when I was younger, play a lot of sports, watch a lot of sports on TV, and, and knew I was always passionate about it. Um, didn't really know until a certain age that I, I wasn't going to be a professional athlete. I had to find a different way in. Um, but 
I did take a lot of chances to find internships and opportunities uh, that related to sports throughout college. So I was lucky enough to um, intern with the Blues just kind of on game nights doing whatever they needed me to do. So one night I was handing out uh, giveaways at the, at the entry. Another night I was in the press box helping out with like kind of the, the website coverage. Um, so there's a lot of different things I got experience there. Uh, and then also in school, I was able to do a, a semester abroad in London and, and get the chance to work with Manchester United United's corporate partnerships team out there. Um, so I got a lot of different experiences, but went to school for economics and always knew I was, I was better and more interested in kind of the numbers side of things rather than what Mike kind of does with, with the writing, even though I did try that for a brief second and realized it wasn't, wasn't for me. Um, but coming out of, of college, I knew I didn't really want to try the traditional like sports path, uh, which in, in my time was, and I don't know if it's still true today, um, become an intern in the ticketing department, do that for a couple of years, then move to a different department. And then eventually like maybe someone in the analytics side of things will, will, will get to know you and you'll get a job there. And I actually took a job with uh, Nielsen in the innovation practice um, for a couple of years, knowing that maybe the long-term goal was still to get back into sports, whether it was through Nielsen's arm of the sports world or corporate partnerships for a corporation um, or on the team side and kind of got lucky with timing in terms of the Blackhawks were looking to hire their first person on the, on the business uh, analytics side. And I was in Chicago at the time kind of looking for new opportunities. Um, it's kind of like one of those lightning strikes and, and right place, right time for me. Um, but definitely to kind of go off what Andrea and Mike said, there's not like one traditional route to get there. You kind of have your long-term goals and you kind of go with the flow until you find the right place. I love it. Well, I tell you, I think it, it makes sense when you think about innovation, uh, specifically with sports. A lot of times the innovation doesn't come from within. It comes from outside uh, when you're trying to move something forward. And it, so it, it sort of makes sense that all three of you in your own way carved your expertise outside of this and then were able to step in and be a part of that innovation within sports. So I, I think that's fantastic. And Chris, you and I had to catch up at some point. I didn't realize you were at Nielsen at one point. I actually started my career uh, myself and two other gentlemen launched Scarborough Sports Marketing in 1999. And uh, I worked for Nielsen, was technically a Nielsen employee for a couple of years as well. So we've probably got some things to catch up on there. Um, that's great. Terrific, guys. Um, I want to take this. I know we, we, it's amazing. Like we could talk to forever and I look up and maybe 45 minutes might not be long enough for these. But um, let's talk about innovation for a second. Uh, and let's talk about the fan experience. And let's live in a non-COVID world for a moment. Okay. Um, in how has innovation helped to improve the fan experience in your opinions to this point? And I think everybody's going to have a different perspective on this. So let, let's start with Mike on this one. Well, what I focus on is uh, it's not so much the business or ticketing side, it's the stack cast technology side. And for what people don't know, people don't know what that is. Um, it's a player tracking system and a ball tracking system. So, you know, you don't have to just rely on the eye test or the scouts, like every movement, every batted ball, every pitch is tracked. And it's, it's cool if you're interested in this kind of stuff, because you can answer with detail the kind of questions you could only argue about in a, in a bar room years ago, right? Like there might've been a time where it was like, well, who's got a stronger throwing arm, uh, Clemente or Willie Mays, right? And you fight about that with your friends. Well, now, now you can know, you can look all that up. Um, not all of the data is public, but a majority of it is we manage a lot of it through baseball savant, which is our stack has clearing house. And not only that, like it's available, almost all of it in, in real time, you can be at a game, you know, or watching at home or whatever, and you can see a ball get crushed and you can look up right away and say, okay, that, that ball was uh, hit 485 feet. That's the longest home run by my team in the last five years. You know, that kind of stuff. Not everybody cares about that. A lot of people care just about did their team win? Was it a nice day at the ballpark? And that's fine. There's not one right way to, to be a fan or to consume sports or anything. Um, but that's, I think the entertainment part of it is right there. That's clear. And then, you know, as far as the analytical part of it, baseball in particular, I think as like a really strong, long time analytical community. I mean, a lot of the people who are writing for these sites, like 
Fangraphs and Prospectus and their own blogs 10 years ago are now running the teams, <laughs> you know? So there's also a part of it where it's like, you don't have to love the nerd stuff, but you have to understand it a little bit to figure out why teams are making these trades or are shifting their infielders in ways they never did before. So it's really, it's taken over the game in a lot of ways, uh, most positive, not all, I would say, but I don't think anybody would want to go back because at the heart of it, teams are just trying to put their players in best, better position to win. And people are understanding the game uh, more deeply than they ever have before. Yeah, I would agree with that. Andrew, you know, from a team perspective and, and kind of stepping away from data for a moment, you know, from a broader perspective, other innovations that you've seen throughout your organization, you feel like have, have made an impact. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, a lot of times when we look at our um, trying to eliminate or remove as many pain points uh, as possible. And so take all the things that you love about, let's say, going to Wrigley Field. Like, you don't want to mess with those. Like, Wrigley's a magical place to watch a baseball game, you know, having a beer in the, in the bleachers and, and a dog and just, like, singing with the crowd and those things. Like, those are all the things that you want to take away and you want to experience. But then what are the things that you're like, man, this is the only negative. It's maybe it's uh, logistics. It's hard to get to Wrigley and park, or maybe it's just getting into the game itself. You know, when you're, when you're talking about going through the magnetometers or getting through uh, the, you know, scanning your tickets or, Hey, you know what? I got three buddies. We're all over you know, Chicago land and I have to figure out how to get them tickets. So what's the best way? Do we have to meet somewhere? Are we going to meet at the Ernie bank statue? And then I'm going to hand out the tickets there or, uh, is there other ways of doing these things just to make it a little bit more seamless, a little bit more easy, a little bit more accessible? And so I think what you see is when you look at it from like, where's the pain, then you can start to see where some of these innovation things have occurred. So for example, on the ticketing side, how do you distribute you know, hard tickets? Well, now everything's going digital. Now I can send my mom a ticket and we can meet at the game and my mom knows how to scan her ticket to get into the ballpark. Like that's pretty cool. Um, you start talking about like, what does it take to get through the security lines just to make sure that you're entering in a safe place. You're starting to see clubs across NFL, across MLB, across MLS, invest in new technology around frictionless screening. So this is the ability to not have to divest what's in your pockets into a bucket. It's the ability to kind of walk right into a ballpark. And if there's a problem, there have sensors, cameras, all components around the process of entering that will identify if there's a threat and then be able to kind of handle that uh, specific incident. But this is now like changing it. So if you can kind of think about like, hey, where are my pain points? Getting into the park, distributing tickets. Maybe it's now getting into mobile ordering and food pickup. Hey, I want to get some more beers. You know, Wrigley has awesome because they have hawkers everywhere. But maybe in the future, you know, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. How do I get in and out of the line as quick as possible so I can get back to my seat? So can I order on an app? Can I go pick it up at a certain time? Is there a kiosk feature? Like, so all these things of like removing the pain is the way I like to look at it. And then you'll see the innovation follow those pieces. I can't make a phone call. Well, now you're starting to see that there's cellular and Wi-Fi systems all over the ballpark. So you can make phone calls, you can connect, you can pull data. So each one is kind of like, ooh, there's the pain. Now here's the innovation to remove the pain. Nice, very nice, thank you. Uh, Chris, I know you live in that data, in that your business analytics. So. Talk a little bit about specifically data. How has that helped improve the, span, the fan experience? Yeah. Um, the biggest one for me is the ability to, to tailor and personalize your experience at the game, whether you're a hardcore fan and, and need to be for the Blackhawks in your seat by, by 659 so you can see the national anthem and then you want to be in your seat from 7 o'clock through the end of the game at 930. Um, and, and being able to not only tailor the right ticket, so you care about being center ice, first row, not on the or on the aisle, so people are or not in the aisle, so people aren't like walking past you all the time. To um, maybe a, a student at at DePaul University in Chicago that had a bunch of friends that don't really know hockey too well, but want something to do on a Wednesday night. Um, and wants to go and, and have a good time, not as much follow, like doesn't know who Patrick Kane or Johnson Taves are and just wants to enjoy the experience. So how do we advertise and market a ticket to them that says, hey, it's cheap, you can afford it, you're not going to be sitting first row, um, but here's here's 10% off beers and here's a good area for you to to socialize at the arena. 
being able to deliver both of those things today, where I think in the past, one, you just had to put out the same message to everyone, and it's only going to appeal to the majority of whoever you choose in your fan base, not every single person. Uh, and then also not being able to then deliver that different experience. So I, I think, especially at the Blackhawks, we've tried over the last couple of years to to provide something for everyone. And I think that's only going to accelerate um, as we get fans back in the building, trying to provide um, a ticket that fits your exact needs, not a ticket to the game that everyone just has to accept. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I, I, the, the custom tailored fan experience, I think, uh, everybody's seeking to be able to do that and data without data, it's going to be very difficult. You're going to be doing a lot of guessing. So I think that's a big plays a very, very big role in that moving forward. Uh, this was a question that was sent in um, and it, it, it actually pulls us away from the ice, the field, the pitch, the stadium and says uh, from an organizational standpoint, what is the most interesting advancement that you've seen and how has it impacted the organization that you work for? And I think each of you we have, you know, are going to come at this from a slightly different perspective. So if you not thinking about what's on the ice and Andrew, you talked a little bit about too, about the machines. And, and I think some of your answer would address this, but um, things that you've seen in the last three or four years, and this could be a COVID related answer. Um, I do have a COVID question coming up, but what do you guys think? Coolest thing you've seen in the last couple of years. So one of the things that, that I think is, is pretty interesting and, um, and I think is starting to become pretty widespread is, is the rise of not just the venue as the main focus of the entertainment, but really the, the build out of the entertainment districts around the actual venues themselves. So in certain places, you know, this art kind of grew very organically and naturally. Like there was a thriving Wrigleyville around the Wrigley Field anyway. But what you've seen is like now the rise of uh, hotels that are connected to venues. You're seeing that there's multi-use uh, retail and commercial buildings that are tied to that, uh, open air plazas. And so what they're really doing is you're, you're kind of shifting it from, I only go to that place for this one event or these specific events, and you're going into it all the time because there's always something happening. There's always a way to engage and, and be entertained. And I it's think that's... Go ahead. No, you go ahead. no, no, you finish. I apologize. I stepped on you. So, so then I think, you know, with that concept of that kind of bubbling district, if you will, that's around there, then the interesting part is then taking that fan experience from inside the venue and bring it out. So it's one big harm, uh, you know, har harmonious, if I got the word right, mm -hmm. uh, experience. So again, it's like, you know, if I'm, if I'm before I even get into the ballpark, before I get to my seat, you're already starting to experience like this, the passion, the fan base, the, you know, the, the just the singing, the music, the everything. And you're like, it's just one big, you know, uh, it, it, one big experience. And it's just getting better and better and better. Uh, it's, it's like that, that to me is, I think, you know, most people are starting to see how that is impacted them as a business, but also just how has it impacted the fans? Like people go to Wrigley just to like hang out at Wrigley now. And like before it'd be like, I'm going to a game. Now it's like I'm going all the time because there's always something cooking there. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned Wrigley, how it organically had the bars up and down Clark Street, uh, Clark Street. But there were ballparks. And I, I'm, I'm curious if you know, it's interesting to see when, when it happened once and then it happened twice. And then you can see the revenue that was coming in and the impacts that you were just describing. It really grew. And now there are they are all over the place. Was Baltimore the first multi-use? Was that the first in Major League Baseball that had the connected? I know St. Louis and Ballpark Village, but I think that was after Baltimore. Do you know who did it first? Yeah, I feel like Baltimore was interesting because they they rebuilt Camden Yards in a, in a part of the city that was, was kind of struggling. And the goal was to get people to come back to the city. And then as they started to incent people to get back, then that started to grow around the ballpark itself. So Wrigley, you know, going way, way back, 100 plus years, same concept, right? It was put in part of uh, Chicago that really wasn't that um, uh, well to do, if you will. But then it kind of naturally and organically grew. So I think Baltimore was one of the more recent ones that have <clears throat> gone down that path. But then I think you're starting to see like now everyone is looking at it. it's not just the sports venue. It's, it's really the district. So one of the more recent ones is Atlanta with the battery. Like when they basically oh, beautiful. 
they had a beautiful ballpark in the middle of downtown Atlanta, but they're like, we're going to start over. We're going to put it closer to the fans and we're going to build an entire district around it. And it's awesome. So, I mean, to me, I think you're, that, that to me is, is, is pretty fascinating to see. And then all the different pieces that roll off that. Yeah. Mike or Chris away from the field, things that have changed within your organizations. I know Mike, you've had multiple organizations, but this, the same one for the last six years, has anything really jumped ahead in the last six years or are you the driver of that? Yeah. I mean, most of my focus is on, on the field so much. I mean, like the, the biggest thing there are other players actually care about data and you're not looked at an outcast because like you're trying to improve yourself. Um, but yeah, off the field, I think part of it is that, um, when I first started, I was maybe looked at as sort of the weirdo in some sense by like the quote unquote traditional baseball writers who'd gone sure. to journalism school and, you know, didn't think there was any value to this kind of stuff. And now I almost feel in some sense, like m- people like me have done almost too good a job because it's like, oh, now everybody does this. How am I going to keep ahead? You know, <laughs> but the fact that everyone is so fluent in this, um, the fact that it's not just writers, that it's not just people in the front office, that now it's like players who are buying in their own time, like high speed cameras and radars and using it to improve their games because they see how much money is to be made there. Um, that is, that's an enormous sea change from like five years ago, you'd go into a locker room and you talk about this stuff and they'd look at you like you had nine heads, you know? And yeah. now it's like, now some of the young guys coming up, I feel like they know more about it than I do. And maybe that's because, you know, I remember life without the internet and they had iPhones when they were seven and they're so used to technology and just like speaking fluently in this language um, that, that I think has changed the game on really and off the field because uh, they're doing it at home too, which I think yeah. is really cool. Well, I think, you know, you have to take a little bit of credit for that guys like you, Mike, that did it when it wasn't as easy and readily available and easy to have other people to look to, to explain and to understand. You talk about people that are coming in uh, advanced at this point, you're the reason, right? Well, guys like you are the reason. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to take any credit, but if you want to offer some, I will <laughs> so gladly. Like if I had to describe my my actual job title in one word, it would be translator, right? Like there are actual like physics doctors, like doctor, you know, Alan Nathan, if you know him at, at Illinois and um, Barton Smith at Utah, like literal physics professors and doctorates who are coming up with new ways to describe the way that the ball is moving. And they're doing like, you know, peer reviewed research papers. And how do I explain that? to anybody, you know, in like five seconds. That's, that is, if I do anything, I think, I hope it's that. Yeah. That's very cool. Chris off the ice. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, for me, it's been really the, the rise of, of the secondary market for, for ticket sales. And I know like ticket resellers, brokers, StubHub even have been along, around for a while, but I feel like over the past decade, last few years, even this trend of, of on demand, um, wanting everything on demand has really taken off and, and people now can make the decision five minutes before the game starts, whether they want to buy a ticket, they can even buy tickets after the game starts and get in for deep discounted prices. Or I think in the past you were having to plan way ahead and buy those tickets way out in advance. It's also forced um, us on the business side to, I think, offer a lot more to our fans because they are getting that, convenience and and sometimes pricing benefits from waiting and buying on on secondary market. So we've had to get a lot better um, about providing more with our ticket. So whether that's you're getting um, money on that ticket to spend on food and beverage, or you're now a season ticket member and you're getting way more benefits uh, that include not just like season ticket holder parties, but exclusive access to the locker room and, and autographs and, and, and meet and greets with players. It's, it's forced us to, to do a lot more, but I think on the whole, it's, it's made the fan experience that we're able to provide uh, a lot more personal and a lot, uh, a lot deeper than it would have been without that secondary market. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, um, guys, we have three questions that have come in that I, I, I like all three of these. Uh, one, I think, is kind of a fun question. One is a very serious question. So I'm going I'm to start with a fun question first uh, and, and just throw this out there to you guys. Actually, I'm going to throw this to Mike. Uh, Mike, this one's for you. Um, how do you feel about trying to move away from umpires and referees and replacing them with artificial intelligence? I know you have a lot of experience with pitch track, which is probably the hottest, most logical one, home plate umpires. How do you feel about that? I would, I would not use the word replace 
Um, I think it's inevitable that that you knock over a guitar on screen. Yeah. uh, um, I think it's inevitable (laughs) and I'm not spilling any inside information here. Just like reading the tea leaves, right. That in the next, I don't know, five, seven years, whatever, there will be an automated strike zone. Like it's already been tested in the minor leagues. And the way I like to think about these things is like, if you started a new sport of baseball today and we weren't just playing the same sport that began around the civil war, would you actually ask umpires to do this? You know, like velocity keeps going up. Everybody's throwing insane sliders. Like the, I know we like to kill umpires, um, but it's like an impossible task that we've given them to try to call balls and strikes with different sized player strike zones and to do it well. And I, I, they do it really well. Every once in a while they screw up and that's the one you notice. Right. So I would say it's inevitable that that will come at some point, but it won't replace umpires. Like they will still be there on the field. I think the idea is that they will still call the balls and strikes, but like, you know, there'll be like a real time earpiece while they'll get the indicator, you know, they still have to call safe out at the bases. They still have to enforce the other rules of the game. So it's not replace. I think it's maybe, uh, you know, improve the experience and make their jobs easier. And I expect at some point in the near future, that's what will happen. I didn't realize when I signed into this today that I was going to see a paranormal experience where the ghost of every dead umpire heard the question and came in and physically moved your guitar as soon as I asked the question. (laughs) It's fantastic. Uh, All right. Uh, The next question that just came in, uh, I am going to, let's see, I'm going to throw this one out to Andrew and say, which sport has the most room for growth? as far as analytics data utilization is concerned. Actually, Chris or Andrew both would probably give the same answer. So I'm going to throw this to Andrew. Yeah, I'm probably a little biased on this one, but um, I'm going to say that the NHL and hockey uh, is kind of on the verge of a major transformation as it relates to data and analytics. Um, There's new solutions being rolled out. Uh, They were tested in the postseason last year, or excuse me, the playoffs, I should say. I keep switching between baseball and hockey. but uh, there's a new solution called player and puck tracking. And I think uh, from my perspective, and again, we're still learning, we're still, you know, uh, making sure the system is working properly and, and it's, it's providing accurate data results and things of that nature. But I think it has the ability to transform hockey very similar to what Sabermetrics did with baseball. Um, and I think that is going to be a major change uh, with the way player evaluation occurs about in-game performance um, about uh, fan engagement. I mean, there's this is this is a major transformation in hockey, and, and I'm excited that you know we're we're right on the beginning of it. But that that would be my answer off the top of the head. Yeah, and I I think I would agree with that, Chris. You want to you look like you want to chime yeah. in on that one. Yeah, I mean, like hockey teams are already deep in in hockey data, right? It's not like we're just like sitting here twiddling our thumbs waiting for this player and puck tracking to to come online, but it is going to allow us to do a lot more than we previously are because it's just like humans are having to code all this stuff where now it's going to come pre-coded you're going to have so much more time to actually dive deep into that analysis i want to like put out like a devil's advocate answer here is that i think baseball actually has a ton of room to grow just because we're kind of at that like plateau where like everyone is kind of i mean mike might say i'm wrong but it's so developed that everyone's kind of almost back on the same level playing field where in hockey, like one team might have the ability to kind of analyze that new player and puck tracking so much better and find something that it's going to give them an advantage for a few years where, where baseball, everyone kind of knows a lot of things that are going on and what other teams are doing and how they're evaluating players. Cause they've all had the data and, and been exposed to, blogs like like fan grabs and things like that so i think the next team that's able to find something that's kind of the secret sauce whether that's a new technology that's going to enable that or just finding people from outside the organization that that think about things differently um is has the potential to have a huge impact in baseball i think the gauntlet has been thrown, Mike. It's up to you to find the next secret sauce. How do you feel about that? Um, well, there are teams working on that. I, I <laughs> slightly disagree with you, Chris, because it seems like that should be the case, but it's not. I mean, there are teams like the Dodgers and Yankees who probably have like 20, 25, 35 person departments. And there are teams that I won't name that have like three people. Um, some teams are really good and some teams are shockingly 
behind the curve, especially because there's like, we just launched a new version of the hardware last year, the Hawkeye tracking system that's opening a lot of doors in pitch design. And I, I know there's some teams that aren't even thinking about this yet. So I would like to say you're, that you're right, but you'd be shocked to know how different it's. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that those teams are just hiding their 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 secret weapon out behind closed doors, yeah. so Mike can't write about it. They're they're not hiding too much. You can find them at the bottom of the standings. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Chris is going to have a job with one of those guys soon if he if he goes this route. Um, all right, next question. I uh, I'm going to jump ahead here on one of these. We have about five minutes left, six minutes. Uh, but when the keynote speaker from today's keynote asks a question, you have to you have to put it in here. Uh, and it it ties back to the last session. Sports betting seems like an emerging space that will be a real focal point in innovation. Uh, rumor has it that Andrew is way ahead of the curve on this, according to Bill. Uh, can Andrew speak just really quickly on the innovation? Uh, uh, the innovative wager oh, that he placed, this is interesting, that he placed during the 2016 Major League Baseball postseason and how that worked out for him. Uh, this, is, this is funny. So Bill is a good friend of mine, and, um, and it's a great <laughs> question. Uh, so there's always a friendly wager that's made between the teams in the postseason. Um, it could be food, Chicago pizza versus New York, you know, X, Y, Z, things of that nature. But uh, during 2016 – uh, I decided to make a bet with each of the teams that we played in that in that postseason run to the World Series, and Bill was was uh, was round one. Now the bet I didn't tell them was the uh, I didn't tell them the exact um, uh, details of what I was going to be calling them on. Who All makes I, a who I, makes a bet without knowing the details? So so I gave them a, a, a kind of a vague uh, a vague bet. What I'd said is I want to need you guys to sing a karaoke song at the uh, MLB summit, which is our annual summit uh, that they did, you know, at the end of the, at the, uh, the end of the season. But I made the same bet to both Bill and to Ralph, who is uh, our counterpart at the Dodgers and then Neil at the Indians. And so once uh, they won the world series and we had that, then I revealed what song they would have to sing in front of everyone. And it was go Cubs go. Now, if you know, go Cubs go, you, uh, you know, it has three verses. So each of the guys had to sing a verse and then, of course, you know, the chorus at the end. So uh, luckily, I, you know, we did videotape it. So um, anytime that we need to get a little bit of uh, poke a little fun at Bill, um, I can always do that. So uh, thanks, Bill, for that one. And uh, yeah, memories that I'll have forever. So thank you. And, and luckily for all of us, Andrew didn't have to sing for our sake. Correct. <laughs> uh, all right, guys, we have three minutes left, so I'm going to do something similar to the last panel, and each person has 30 seconds to answer these next two questions. Um, we'll start with prediction time. What do you think will be the biggest innovation or advancement in the next 10 years? So, so get crazy. What do you think might be the biggest thing that happens in the next 10 years? And if I stumped you, just let me know. Uh, I think, I'll, I'll go quick. Sorry, Andrew. I think just like the innovation of like flexible ticketing, I think we're going to hit a whole new level where like season tickets, your traditional like 81 games or, or 44 for hockey with preseason are probably going to be a thing of the past. And you're going to be, we're going to be at such a point where prediction that you're going to be able to know exactly how much inventory you have. If someone's buying 16 games or 20 or 10, um, it's just going to, the ticketing products available are going to be so different. Interesting. Okay. I was going to say the umpire thing, but we already talked about that. So there you uh, go. I, I mean, it's just going to be continually getting denser and denser data. I mean, like I said, last season, we just launched a replacement of all the hardware that tracks that power stack cast. Uh, even just in a two month season, we started to see some of the fruits of that. And over the next five years, there's going to be so much more because now the, the hardware, and the granularity of the data has improved and teams are like literally hiring PhDs to dig through this. So I think you'd think after 160 years of a sport, there wouldn't be so much more you could learn. And it turns out we're very wrong about that. Now explain to me how sometimes I can clearly tell that a ball was a ball, but pitch pitch tracks or stack ass or something tells me it's a strike. How's that possible, Mike? I can clearly see that it was a ball. Your eyes are lying to you. Okay, um, that's that mostly it. it's a dirty secret. <laughs> People like to think the thirty ballpark center field cameras are all like dead on, and they are very much not. Try to compare yeah. them sometimes. Some are like slightly off center, and it can really screw with your frame of reference. That makes sense. I'll accept that, Andrew. 
So I, I think, you know, this is a tough one. 10 years is a long time. But, you know, one of the things that I think is, is you're starting to see changes into is, is the consumption of the game itself. Uh, it's, it's the right now, I feel like there's a big divide between the in venue experience compared to the out of venue. And I think you're going to start to see this merger of convergence of like how you experience the game itself. You know, whether you're at home, you're watching it on TV, that's an experience, whether you're in venue, that's an experience. And they're so distinctive and so different. But I, I, again, nothing I can like, point to. But I feel like that is something that is going to be able to be blended a lot more seamlessly. Yeah. Uh, how you're consuming it and audio, video, smells, tastes, experiences, that the ability to do it from anywhere. Um, I, I think that's that's going to become closer and closer together. And, and that, I'm excited because pulling that off is going to be really, really interesting. But I, I think that's that's a huge area for growth. Yeah, I'm going to guess somebody in this audience is going to be a part of these innovations, too. I'm counting on that. Uh, last one before I let you guys go. Uh, we're going to bring this back to the to directly to the attendees. Um, if somebody wanted to go into this field, technology, innovation, professional sports, what's one piece of advice, 30 seconds or less, what's one piece of advice that you would give this group? I would start with uh, don't wait for permission. Like if you've got a good idea and you've got some skills, it's pretty easy to get noticed now as long as you've got a, a valuable and unique opinion. Like, you know, no, nobody needs another breakdown of like the five best trades of the winner, right? But if you've got some skills and interest in uh, analyzing the data in a new way or providing a, a, a value or an opinion that, you know, a team or a broadcaster, whomever doesn't have, like I've seen people get hired off of one cool blog post, just like showing the skill they have. And you can't wait for someone to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to pay you to do it. It's free and easy to fire up a WordPress press blog and tweet the heck out of it. So if you've got passion for it, uh, don't let anybody tell you you're allowed or not allowed to pursue that. That's great. I'll, I'll build off mics and I'll say a key, a key word that I heard in there is, is it's like demonstrating your skills. And I will say it's a focus on building skills. It doesn't necessarily have to be built skills directly in sports. It could be building skills that you can apply to sports. So there's so much in sports on the business side as well as on the actual field that you can have skill sets, whether it's data and analytics, whether it's software development, whether it's infrastructure and operations. I mean, this is more on the tech side, but keep on going. It could be marketing. It could be sales. Build strong skill sets so that you're offering something to the team and constantly learn. So it's, you should never be you know, set with, oh, I know this and that's all I'm going to do. You got to be constantly building skills, constantly pushing yourself. And then when that opportunity uh, opens up, then you can jump on it. That's great. Both of them. Chris, how about you? Yeah. Just don't, don't limit yourself to having to do something within sports. I think all of these advances and innovations that that we we talked about today started outside of the sports industry. Um, So if if you're interested in something and it's not hit the sports world yet, um, don't be afraid to, to gain some experience and learn about it outside of the sports world. And then, um, don't ask for permission. Like Mike said, like find your team or, or find someone who's, who's open to it and, and present your idea and how it's going to help in the sports industry. And we're, we're always looking for those new ideas. This is great guys. It, it, it's been, it's been really cool to have three, what I would call uh, disruptors that have been able to build something outside of sports and step in and, and make a change and make a difference and move things forward. Uh, I look forward to uh, getting to know each of you guys more. I know that the attendees do as well, and I'm looking forward to seeing what they bring to the table over the next 10 years. So thank you, Andrew, Chris, Mike. You guys were terrific guests. Uh, We appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you.